Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this, this important conversation we're going to have with our mayor, Eric Garcetti. We're living at a, at a moment in our history like no other, dealing with this extraordinary injustice and racial inequality, at the same time worried about our own safety and security in our communities, and at the very same time uh, dealing with the results of COVID-19, what our community is going to look like before, during, and after. And when the mayor and I discussed doing this town hall, that was going to be the subject. But clearly, in the last week, everything has changed. It hasn't changed in terms of COVID-19, and we do need to address that and the health concerns and the health issues affecting our city and our country. But we certainly need to talk about inequality. We certainly need to talk about racial justice. We certainly need to talk about how we can make this country and our community fair and safe for every single one of us. At times like this, we need great leaders and leadership is tough. And I want to thank, first of all, the mayor for his leadership. It is never easy. Things happen too fast. They happen too slow. They happen this way. They happen that way. All you are when you're a leader, and I know that from my job, is you're criticized before anyone asks if they want to help you. And so I want to thank Mayor Eric Garcetti for making time today but also I want to thank him for his leadership because it's never easy to lead in troubled times. So I'm going to turn it over for, for his opening and then we're going to have a conversation. Mayor Garcetti, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Jay, and to what looks like 588 people that are on this call today. Uh, at one of the most trying moments, certainly in our city's history, in our nation's and world's history, and in our lives. And let me just take a moment to contain your pain because I certainly have it too. The, these are not days that we wish for or days that we want, but they are days that we have and we have to march through them and march through them together. Um, our people know that uh, it is not new. I was talking long before this week of the suffering that we've seen out and throughout our country that for the first time with COVID-19, some communities of color were saying, we're just used to having things worse. For a lot of people who are experiencing for the first time, uh, that resilience or that trauma, the flip sides of the same thing sometimes can feel new. All of us right now are in a moment of trauma, of deep trauma, and our collective community's trauma, whether we've experienced it directly or just heard about it from our parents and grandparents and our ancestors before, we know that we not only have a leadership role in terms of our resilience to continue, but we have also a responsibility as folks who have helped build Los Angeles and this country to try to lead at those moments. And it's one of the few things that I hold on to is in, in asking who we are and who I am moving forward. We are facing a two front challenge right now. COVID-19 was the biggest health challenge of our lives and the biggest economic downturn in our lives. So in many ways, that was already two challenges. When the third challenge of our ongoing fight for racial justice and equality in this country reared its ugly head yet again. And the killing of George Floyd evoked, I know for so many of us, the images in weeks and months and years and decades past. The repressed rage of racism, the passions of the prejudice that we've all seen in our country. We had a moment of unity, and I believe we can still have one of unity, where more police officers than I've ever heard and police chiefs joined together with activists and everyday Americans who said, this is absolutely wrong. And in some ways, that was a reflection of the progress that we've made. I was talking with Congresswoman Karen Bass a couple nights ago, and she said, I always have to preface by telling our young people, I know you're not going to believe it, but 30 years ago, it was much, much worse. That while we look at the mountaintop and you can only see that we have gone nowhere and the peak is above us, some of us can look down and see how far we've come to get to at least the middle of that mountain. That we see 30 years ago, we had a racist police chief who would uh, was more powerful than the mayor who said that black people's veins were different, which is why when we used chokeholds on them, they were dying in disproportionate numbers. Um, we had riots and unrest that were all about Los Angeles being the worst. 
And since then, we are no longer the worst. I think we are among the best, though we still, as a nation, have so much more to do. So I will just kind of con conclude my opening comments with this, is I need each one of you. Our healing, our recovery, our peace will not come from just City Hall. It will come from this entire city. But my promise to you is that we'll never stop working to rebuild businesses whose windows are shattered, to deliver justice for communities of color that still don't have it, to deliver the basic city services and the protection that will get us through this COVID-19 and not just rebuild the city, but I hope for all of us, this is a moment to reimagine the city. Uh, one of my rabbis last night, I was talking to Sharon Browse from ECAR and she said, this is a moment for this nation potentially to have the rebirth of what a multiracial democracy actually looks like and for us all to embrace it. And I don't want you to choose between peace and justice. We're throwing everything we have at maintaining peace in our city. That is the foundation for anything. But we're throwing everything that we have to build justice and don't choose a side. Don't be split between that. Don't caricature somebody wearing a badge or holding a sign. We have to find the common humanity that I saw begin to blossom on our streets even yesterday when a commander, Corey Palka, who's a friend in the West Bureau, was at Crescent Heights and Sunset and took a knee with protesters who began to hug him. There's no reason we all shouldn't take a knee to the brutality that we saw. And there's no reason we shouldn't all demand that looters keep our, away from our city and are dealt with with justice and the law as well. Don't choose a side, but embrace both the peace that is necessary, the justice that we demand, and then the hard work to get through a pandemic and rebuild our economy in a way that maybe is a little bit better even than the economy we had before we started. Thanks, Jay, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. And look, I, I think that some people are questioning why you're even doing this, uh, this town hall, why we decided to continue it. Can you, can you talk about why you think it's important to communicate during this time? Because to me, uh, we need more communication, not less communication. A hundred percent, Jay. If we can't talk to each other, how are we going to heal? How are we going to find the common ground? There's a lot of shouting at each other right now. And sometimes that shouting is the right, righteous recognition of the rage that we have. But after that dies down, it has to lead to dialogue and action. And you can't take those steps no matter what you want without us listening to each other, which is why this is so critical. I'll be running around the city today, doing everything from helping clean up businesses to you know, stopping by to talk to demonstrators. I'll be talking to the community uh, at large and young people about what we need to do and reminding people about COVID-19. All of us need to have these conversations. Don't just sit, sit back and watch them on TV. Engage, be a healer, find the better angels. Don't find the enemies whether it's government or police officers or the protesters or whoever we can create in our minds are the enemies, that will only help this virus, that will only help the perniciousness of racism, which thrives off of division. And if we can find that unity, we've got a chance. So we, we really, I know people don't wanna hear about it, they wanna hear us talk about one thing, but there's really many things going on at one time. And I'm wondering, given the fact that you are probably in one of the most high pressure jobs in the world right now, how you're managing in terms of uh, all, dealing with all the issues and all the balls in the air. How are you coping and managing and prioritizing? Well, it's, it's the most painful days probably of my professional life and in many ways among the most painful in my personal life, but I think many of us feel that. And I also am very aware that I've got a, a healthy family and none of us have died from COVID-19 and that we're not hungry or living on the streets and I'm not likely to get a cop's knee into my neck that would kill me. Um, you can't ignore your mental health and your pain. I think all of us have to talk about it with each other. I have a prayer circle that's led by not a Rabbi Rouse, but Rabbi Leader, because I'm a member at Wilshire Boulevard as well, um, and a group of pastors and a Muslim religious leader and others who are praying with me. Um, I think we all need prayer more than ever, not just for ourselves, but for our city. Um, I try to find those moments with my family, but this is not a moment, I think, for my own health. It's to try to build the health of the city. There's more attacks that come from those who seek to divide, and those land on all of our shoulders. They're gonna, we've seen attacks on the Jewish community. We see people attacking the African-American community. We see people attacking all police officers. We see people attacking all the protesters. 
Um, and I think it's up to us for all of us to say, wait a second, where's the humanity in this? And then just close your eyes at the end of the night and try to find your humanity and know that this will be passed. Though in a couple of weeks, we won't have this on the streets at a, at a maximum. And in a couple of years, we will not at a maximum uh, be in a pandemic. And we will rebuild a better tomorrow. Just think about this during the riots in 1992, during that unrest, 55 people were already dead at this point. People were attacking people. They were pulling them out of cars. The rage was being expressed, Angelino against Angelino. And thank God that we've come close. And this is my first priority. We haven't lost lives and I need to keep protecting lives. The lives of our police officers, the lives of our protesters, even the lives of our looters, because though they are wrong and need to be stopped and put in jail, we can't see people die as a result of this moment. Um, and I think if we can get through that, that's what I hang on to, that there is going to be a better day. Today was better than yesterday. I believe tomorrow can be too. So you're, you're confident that you feel like things will simmer down in the coming days and maybe uh, you're saying a couple of weeks. I think people, you know, when I was in my house yesterday uh, in Encino, there were sirens all day long. Um, you know, I, I think people do feel unsettled even the ones who are going and wanting to peacefully protest feel unsettled. So, well, you know, how, how, how are we going to get our city back? Look, I, at this point, I've learned not to be confident about anything, but just to do our best to work towards that. I can say that last night was absolutely better than the night before, and the night before that was better for sure than the day before that. So things are at the same time incredibly unsettling to see um, to hear sirens all day long, to see our National Guard out there securing sites. But I also see in moments, you know, flashes of hope where protesters at City Hall embraced, you know, the National Guard. And there was a lot of people who said that's going to evoke really ugly and um, kind of toxic things, while at the same time, I think we've humanized who those people are and why they're there to protect us. And they've done an amazing job. Um, I've seen not just the Commander Palka that I mentioned, but other officers take a knee or walk with protesters. I've seen us say, look, if any officer is out of line, here's how you complain. And we have that system set up. And I've seen the chief hand those cards out, get behind quote unquote lines and have co conversations with people to hear them. And vice versa, I've seen the pain of this moment. I, don't, I, I won't underplay that. If you've had your windows smashed and everything that you built stolen at a weekend that you were hoping to stand your business up, if you're an employee finally looking forward to a paycheck after two months of not having one, no, it's not going to be quick. It's not gonna be easy, but I have said the city will stand up, no charge, all the cleanup for those businesses. We're gonna be announcing help to get those businesses back on their feet. And I think we're gonna lean in pretty hard on the issue of racial justice. And even in the toughest budget year of my life, we're gonna shift those priorities to build on what we've done long before this of youth employment and peace and reconciliation of looking at racism in a structural way and, and starting a civil and human rights commission that was ready to go before this all happened, but we will accelerate because of it. All of those things begin to show um, our city that we are, I don't see this as a moment. We see this as a requirement of a larger movement to build justice while we protect our city. So I, I'm always, a, I, I would rather see myself as a person of action than of words. Um, I, I, I feel like that's been my life's work. I want to know what I can do, right? I want to know what I can do. I hear it from a lot of people. I also want to know what the Jewish community can do. Do you, do you have a sense of how we can help not just rebuild the city, but actually deal directly with this tremendous injustice in our community? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, let me praise the Federation for what you've been doing during COVID-19 at a moment when all of our agencies are uh, way underwater or having less money than ever. Thank you to everybody who's been giving and donating and helping with small loans and teen talk to help people through the mental health of this moment. I mean, it's been heroic. I've seen such, long before we saw what happened this past week, I've seen such rays of light across this city of generosity of love in the midst of COVID-19 and specifically from Federation and our community. Um, prominent Jewish Angelinos who have helped us raise $53 million to give cash assistance and senior meals and help immigrants 
and childcare for our healthcare responders. There's so much to do. What we've done around food, which you know uh, is so important, I know, to our community. So keep doing that first and foremost, because COVID-19 is not over and it is the thing that will be begin before and after this moment about our racial justice. Second though, so I would say start with ourselves, you know, in your business or in your organization, go through implicit bias training as we've done with each one of our police officers. Let's not pretend we don't all harbor some bias in our hearts, conscious or unconscious, and let's be aware of it. Because what folks are asking for is for us to erase this in our hearts, not just in our policies. Um, and there are great people to do that. That might not seem like an action, but I would say it's the foundation of how you can see and understand and empathize with what it means to be black in America today. Second, engage in formal conversation um, and take this struggle on that it isn't just a struggle for and of and by and about African Americans, but it is a Jewish struggle. It is an Anglo struggle, it is a Latino struggle, it is an API struggle, a native struggle. This is something which we can't just have shouldered on the backs of our black brothers and sisters. And then third, what I would say is organize around the places where we can invest in justice, which isn't just about the criminal justice system. Uh, I've been building a summer youth jobs program since I became mayor. When I came in, we only had 5,000 jobs each summer for all the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Angelino youth. I'm very proud that we've built that up over seven years to now 20,000 jobs a year. But most of those still come from the public sector. Can you hire somebody who didn't start at the same starting line that everybody else that you know did, who started 50 yards behind, and give them a summer job and a couple thousand dollars and a mentorship? Like, let's get involved in a very personal way and I invite you to be a part of that because even with COVID-19, I'm going to be leaning in on our summer youth jobs program to say this should be a summer of peace. Imagine if you're young and black and after all this dissipates, you're still stuck at home and there's no jobs this summer. Don't tell me there's going to be good outcomes from that. So it's on all of us to do that work, to find those young people that are hurting so much and to say, yes, our criminal justice system needs to not kill you first and foremost, but our economic system has to find you lift you up and give you the opportunities many of us have just by virtue of who we are growing up. And we were gonna talk about first and foremost COVID-19 before we, before we got into obviously the issues of the day. And I, I'm wondering uh, as things start to open up, I keep hearing from a lot of Jewish leaders about what it means to open up. Um, you know, will there be the ability to have high holiday services? Um, what kinds of protocols are gonna be in place for young people to gather? Can you give me a, us a sense of, you know, when we get through the, the initial piece of this, and obviously we have a lot of work to do to create the kind of just city and just country we want, and we can't take our eye off of that. But in the meantime, you're right. All the issues around COVID-19 directly impact this because if you're out of work, you're out of work, and you're more likely to be out of work if you're a minority. So how does the city uh, open up and how do you see the Jewish community opening up in the coming weeks and months relative to COVID-19? Well, the irony of this, or not irony, but the sadness of this weekend was this was going to be a weekend of opening. Um, you don't have to open because you can. And I've told people really take the time to make sure whether it's a synagogue or a store that you take the time to make sure that you and your congregation and or your customers are safe. And we've given a lot of guidance. That should have been this weekend when instead we've seen a curfew come in and, and some businesses um, not only not be able to open, but be looted and, and lose their stock. I've been containing before this moment a lot of optimism and worry simultaneously. I guess that's a good Jewish thing, right? We're, we're always optimists and we worry too. But it was a very Jewish moment in that way because we really earned the optimism. Um, we're not moving beyond COVID-19, but we're learning how to live with it. And I think we've done it and we've been smart. Um, there's, you know, some folks who need to think of themselves as the hardcore openers and other people who are the hardcore closers. And I say, like, don't be either. Um, take the construction trades. We, we kept those going without large outbreaks by just being smart and having inspectors and people wearing PPE and training the employees how to maintain the social distancing, even as they're on construction sites. That's going to be the same in office spaces and stores. And it's on us. If we take this moment and the chaos of this moment and say, oh my gosh, forget it, I don't have to wear a mask, I don't have to wash my hands, I don't have to maintain physical distancing in my synagogue, in my street, in my home. Oh, I'll have a bunch of 
friends come over, young people in particular, I think are all hanging out in each other's backyards and can be spreading this. We have to take personal responsibility. And I know it's painful not to have everything come back, but I'm worried that everybody's like, oh, we're kind of beyond COVID-19 now. And whether it's protesters who aren't wearing masks or maintaining physical distancing, or people who are like, well, it doesn't seem like the cases are very high. Let me remind us all that 95% of us, at least in Los Angeles County, have not become COVID-19 positive. And so it can infect a lot of people and kill a lot of people, but we can at the same time get smarter, focus on our seniors, focus on people with pre-existing conditions, cut our deaths, I think, even as we see cases probably go up while some of this happens. But if you are able to stay safe and listen to what the health officials say and don't turn this into something political that you're either for or against, just listen to that advice and enact it, um, we'll be able to manage this. And I have confidence. So on that mix of kind of Debbie Downer and your high school sports coach, we can do this, but don't screw it up. So we are seeing gatherings happening, obviously, um, relative to the protests. Do you envision uh, 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 September for the high holidays where people are able to gather in their uh, synagogues for high holidays? I think so, but it will look different. Um, and so we have to think that through. Um, I mean, the entire congregation can't be in the isn't allowed by the state. And I know it gets very confusing. A lot of people say, "Why, Mayor? thank you, Mayor Garcetti, for doing X, or why did you do Y? And I often say, look, there's certain things I can do. I can be more restrictive, but the state tells us what we can do, and the county enacts what we actually are doing, because they're the health authority. So I give a lot of guidance, and if I, if I want to go slower, I can do that, but I can't go any faster. So it's mandated right now. It's only 25% of the congregation, or 100 people, whatever is less, not more, but less. So it won't look the same. It won't be everybody. We'll have to figure out probably a combination of how to do it electronically and in person or in shifts or something, but that those shifts even have danger with the number of people who will come in. Um, it won't look the same this year, but I do believe that we, if we don't see indicators, and that's a big if, you know, if things do go way up, you know, talk to me in a month and a half. It's on all of us to make sure our indicators stay down. But if they stay where they are and are stable or even improve, then we will be in an environment which some people can still go into a synagogue, I believe the capacity will still stay under. And remember, long services, which are the high holidays by definition, are more and more dangerous the longer you spend time in a closed space without ventilation. It's just a public health truism. So um, we'll have to rethink how to do that while still meeting the spiritual needs of ourselves as individuals in a community. One of the things that you have talked about a lot in, uh, in your time as being mayor of Los Angeles is homelessness. And clearly homelessness is impacted by everything that's happening right now. Um, what, what happens in terms of uh, the, the issue of homelessness as we move forward post COVID-19 and even post the riots right now? I'm sorry, the demonstrations and, and some, I, don't want to, I don't want to say riots, the demonstrations. Yeah. No, thank you for the correction. I think the chief said something that he regretted that he corrected last night too when he misspoke, we're all speaking a lot. And, uh, and I think everybody knows that uh, we'll cut each other some slack. So with ho homelessness, as many people know, has kind of been a passion in my life long before I was, or ending homelessness, I should say, long before I was mayor. I started volunteering on Skid Row when I was 14. And I always imagined conversations between the 49-year-old Eric Garcetti and the 14-year-old Eric Garcetti to see just how we collectively as a city, as a county, and as a society have never solved this issue. And in many ways, it's gotten so much worse. Um, I mean, I'll cut to the chase both and if you want the big answer and then I'll get very specific about LA. I don't think we'll end homelessness, not just in Los Angeles, but in this nation until we have some more deeper right to housing. That might rub some people politically the wrong way. It might excite others, but it's just a practical point. Every country I've seen that doesn't have homelessness or that's ended it has a kind of universal right to housing that deals with everybody's other secondary traumas and problems from mental health or addiction, um, sexual and domestic violence that they've survived, uh, PTSD from wars, et cetera, indoors. So you get people in housing first as a predicate. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but Japan had a lot of homelessness. And when our president said, oh, the streets are so clean in Tokyo, not like in LA and San Francisco, which are disgusting and filthy and homelessness, we actually looked at what Japan did and they ended homelessness by offering every homeless person housing and paying for it and giving them an income. Uh, I've worked very closely uh, with candidates. I've been working with Secretary Ben Carson to expand what's called Section 8 vouchers, and I've gotten it on Joe Biden's um, uh, agenda to put 
universal access to Section 8 vouchers, which is a way to get into both private and publicly built housing. Um, if you are hungry in this country and you qualify for it, you get food stamps. It's an entitlement because nobody should go hungry in America. If you don't have health care and you're extremely poor, uh, we don't say, sorry, you're going to die. We give you Medicaid, what we call Medi-Cal here. But if you qualify for housing in America, in this city, uh, nationwide, it's one in four. In this city, it's a one in eight chance that you'll actually get a housing voucher. So seven out of eight, peop out of eight people are on our streets. Um, we've never done as much and it's still not enough. So this crisis, this is a real opportunity on homelessness. We were rightfully so uh, bragging that thanks to the voters and others and pushing really hard against even some initial community opposition, we were building um, a number of what were called bridge home shelters, about 30 of them that would house 2,200 people and it took us 18 months, which is the fastest pace in the country to house them. Then COVID-19 hit, our rec centers were available, our hotels were available, and we housed about 3,000 people in six weeks. Two years ago, I said we needed a FEMA level response to homelessness, and I asked FEMA if they would pay for it because this was a crisis, and they said, no, we don't pay for things until the flood comes, until the earthquake hits. Well, thankfully in this one, FEMA changed, and they said, people experiencing homelessness before they have COVID-19, you can house and we'll pay for three quarters of those costs. So I, together with mayors up and down the state, together with uh, Governor Newsom, have put hundreds of millions of dollars into Project Room Key now, 3,000 hotel rooms, another 1,000 uh, beds in our rec centers uh, that are close to 4,000 people now off the streets. But we can't let them hit the streets when this is done. So I'm working very hard now to take some of our coronavirus relief funds and to push the feds and the state government to say, let us permanently house them, whether that's buying motels that might never come back, popping up housing where we can in publicly owned spaces, or giving people vouchers that they can take into the private marketplace. Um, we could house more people than we've housed in decades and set onto a path to imagining the end of street homelessness. But that is still years off if we don't have a right to housing in this country, and it breaks my heart. So um, I, I'm, I'm privileged to know Chief Moore. He's been a great friend to the Jewish community. And, you know, in, in 2008, when we created the first uh, community security initiative for a Jewish community in North America, we have worked closely with local law enforcement. It's been very positive and very supportive. On the other hand, right now, obviously, law enforcement is, in, in, is kind of in the middle of all these conversations, including the funding of, of law enforcement and the amount of funding law enforcement gets. I know that LA has gone through tremendous growth in terms of uh, sensitivity of the, of the police, um, but also in terms of how our, our chief and how our force does its work. What will the impact on this uh, be on, on our, our police force, on the funding of the police force, et cetera, et cetera? Our, our police department gets a lot of attention as well, it should in this moment because the conversation nationally is about policing. Um, when the COVID-19 crisis hit, I kind of said two things aren't gonna, I drew a line around two things, essentially who you need when you call 911 and our sanitation, picking up the trash and, and making sure your toilets flush. Uh, the very basic services, obviously water and power as well. Um, I didn't cut any programs in this city. And I said that departments would have to find savings of about 10%, including through furloughs, which I hope if Washington does deliver help um, to us locally, which we're demanding across the nation, and for our states, we can get rid of, but the programs won't be cut. The pay was cut. Um, there are some who, you know, in social justice community have called for defunding of our police department, like cutting its funds, let's say by half or three quarters. And I gotta tell you, I couldn't responsibly ever do that. Um, that would mean communities where we've seen the lowest crime rates in years, hundreds of murders a year that are now, that were down would see that tick up. I don't wanna see no police department. I wanna see good police department. I don't wanna see no police officers when I call. I don't want somebody who's the victim of domestic violence to wait twice as long and maybe lose her life. I don't want somebody who's the victim of sex trafficking to not have somebody in a specialized unit who can investigate that and liberate her from her oppression. I don't wanna see rape kits have a backlog again. I think it's very important to have guardians who are funded but it's also, I think there's been some stats out there that are a little bit misleading. And let me just correct them if folks have seen them because I know it's all over social media that you know 70% or 54% of our budget goes to policing. All cities in California, because we have cities and county that divide and school districts are local responsibilities. 
do have their largest departments usually are police departments by definition. Fire departments are usually second together with public works. Um, but it, depending on how you cut it, the number, the graph that everybody keeps pointing to, it's talking about just some, a limited source of funds that the police department represents about 54% of those. But of our entire city budget, it's either 70, you can look at three ways, 10, 17, or 30%, but it's nowhere close to half. Um, we have a $30 billion budget if you include everything we do, including our water and power, our airport, our ports, and it represents about 3 billion of that, so about 10%. Um, if you look at just our city's non water and power departments, we have a $10.5 billion uh, budget. So it is very important for me to take the second piece of what I believe what people are saying, which is, are we making investments outside of just a, a police department when we look at justice and safety? And the question is, and the answer is absolutely yes. I'll give you one example. We had a budget for around homelessness. that was about $12 million when I started. It's now this year going to be uh, almost 700 million almost 700 million, by far the biggest area we've put money into. Our library hours have dramatically expanded and our library department probably went up the most in percentage uh, because I think that's an investment in young people and safe places and, and their futures. Um, if you combine the city and the county governments, because remember it's the county that has our welfare and our mental health and our hospitals and all of the things that that's where we segregate that off to. Public safety is not 54% of where our tax dollars go to, nor should it ever be. So I think that there is a righteous conversation to have about how can we double down on certain investments. And so it's too early, either tonight or tomorrow in my press conference, I will be announcing some of that. I'm working with community members and others that even while we have a deficit, I don't care. I think it is a moment we have to reallocate funds to put them into the places that will heal this nation and address the racial injustice that we have. And um, that's not something that started because People were out on the streets today. Uh, certainly for me as mayor, that began seven years ago and it needs to be accelerated because what we're hearing around the country. So all of these things we're talking about really make me worried about the increasing polarization in our city and our country, right? And where people seem to be taking sides, people seem to be going inward, not outward. Um, you know, what's your message Mayor Garcetti to, to, uh, to the community in terms of, and here's the Jewish community. And I take full responsibility when I took this job 10 and a half years ago, I made the number one priority of my job to the, the, the safety and the welfare of the Jewish community. And I did that recognizing that no one else was looking out for the Jewish community, but here we are, it's 2020, the world is changing. And I am asking myself what I could do more but I'm also worried about this polarization. And as the mayor of a, an extraordinarily rich and diversity city under siege and frankly in real pain, how do we move forward when we know what's in front of us? I think the only way that we can is by being brave. We have to step up and step out because you're right. Long after this crisis and COVID-19, this is, there are some dangerous forces and I don't mean the conspiracy theory ones. I mean, the structural and kind of technological ones that we have around us. Fewer people do their own research. Everything's about whatever the tweet of the moment is. It's spliced and out of context and maybe it's even misleading. It's people pretending to be, I was on MSNBC just before this and there, there's all these people from, uh, there's a law enforcement official saying there's a lot of people from the far left masquerading as the far right online and vice versa to stoke the tensions. Um, but among the kind of middle, I've just noticed even in the last week, so many people who, whether it was like Antifa is coming to Bel Air and here's the, the tweet that shows it, please send the National Guard, or whether it's folks saying completely defund police, this is the biggest you know, uh, thing and uh, sorry, this is more than half of our budget and they're all a bunch of fascist pigs. Um, it's resonating with more people than I would think. And I think we have to organize, we have to educate, we have to have the longer face-to-face -face conversations. We have to insist in getting out when we can after all of this with a curfew in COVID-19, which makes it so difficult, which is why these technologies and people can prey on this moment to do face-to-face -face conversations and community organizing and projects with our hands where we're building things and painting things and um, you know, restoring things. If we are gonna sit, I know this is ironic because we're all watching each other and you're watching me in two dimensions, but in a two-dimensional inside our own room's life, this society will collapse. We will corrode it little by little until we have very little in common left. 
in which it is about tribal affiliations. And I don't mean in the sense that we say we're members of the tribe, but tribal political affiliations. And we're just gonna be looking for enemies around us, demonizing anybody we can find, classifying people based on the color of their skin or the badge they wear or the yarmulke that they have. That is not a, a place that we can afford to go. So be brave, step up, step out and organize and then do work and do work with people who are different from you and listen, just listen. We are so interested in shouting and being heard. And sometimes there are voices that haven't been heard and we need to give them space. But for the rest of us, listen. And I think you'll hear your city, you'll hear reason, you'll hear, I think, love, and you'll hear hope because people can't live in this pain and this fear for very long. Uh, it is untenable, it is not who we are, it's not what we've grown up with, and it's not what we will have after this, but that's on all of us to build. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something which is, uh, you've given us an hour and I, and I wanna let you, I do wanna let you go back to uh, protecting and, and making sure that our city moves forward in the most positive way. So I'm just gonna ask you one more question, end a little early so that you have more time to Thank really you. take care of our community. And I, I you know, I, I want us to end this conversation on, on an uplifting, aspirational point of view. I've been telling people uh, relative to what it looks like getting out of COVID-19. I call it a four act play. The last act is after we all have vaccines and we can go back to a little bit more like the world was before COVID-19. But I've been saying that even though we'll be under resourced and even though our challenges will be greater than they've ever been, I am so optimistic that we will come out of this even stronger. So, so Mayor Garcetti, um, relative to the aftermath of this horrific incident that happened in Minneapolis and our need to really provide justice for all and equality for all and our, our need to get stronger after COVID-19, what message of hope and aspiration can you give to us? I would say that every moment of our nation's most painful chapters is followed by a better one the Depression and World War II brought in an era of unprecedented prosperity. It is through the civil rights struggle that we ended segregation, um, that when we fight for things like equality, we see those moments come. Justice isn't easy, we know that as a people, but this is a moment exactly, not just to respond and react, and not just in the next phase to rebuild, recover, reopen, but this is a moment to reimagine, to reimagine. Because I said in my state of the city, you know, this is the city of angels and we will fly again, but only if we reimagine who we are. I don't want to go back to normal if normal means homelessness. I don't want to go back to normal if normal means traffic. I don't want to go back to normal if normal means pollution. And none of these things are easy or else they would have been solved decades ago. But can we have the courage to reimagine at this moment and to take the pain and to take the resilience that we will get from these days and apply them to say, I have a role in making a more just economy because it's not right the way things are. I have a role to have a more accountable system that doesn't employ racism to keep certain people where they are and others where they are. Um, can we actually do those things to rebuild a city that's an example? Again, we've got all the ingredients. My God, Los Angeles is a place compared to everywhere else in the world where people feel ownership of a city. They feel they belong. Uh, Los Angeles is a place with the most brilliant minds and creative people and diverse economy and amazing geography that's linked to the growth of the world in the Pacific Rim and Latin America. We are a place with all the ingredients to model that and to do that. So we don't have any choice but to lead. We don't have any destiny but to find that. I'm not underplaying how tough that work will be, but absolutely, we will see a reimagined Los Angeles because every single time we've gone through trauma, we do emerge better, we do emerge stronger. And there's no reason that this generation of all of us shouldn't do that same thing and reap its rewards. Well, thank you very much, Mayor Garcetti, for leading us during this complicated time. I'm raising my hand, whatever I can do as an individual, whatever the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles can do to help you in this effort during this challenging time. I'm raising my hand to tell you that we are here for you and we're here for the city of Los Angeles. I wish you great strength and patience as we go through the coming days and know that we are here whenever you need us. Thank you, much love to you, Jay, and to everybody whose faces I couldn't all see, but thank you for finding our better angels. Keep me in your prayers. I certainly have you in mind and we will march forward.
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.